Okay, we're live. If you're tuning in after the event, um, we're going to be starting in 30 seconds, a minute or so. Um, we're just chatting right now, starting the broadcast. Um, this is Jennifer Hawes, who you can't see. She's just a bunch of lines. Um, <laughs> but I promise she's a person. I saw her earlier. Um, and she's not not some kind of like library AI that BPL is rolling out. Uh, yes, the um, the wonders of technology, um, of uh, virtual programming. So I've turned into a bunch of lines this evening. Um, I am Jennifer Haas, the branch librarian of the North End Branch Library. And um, I don't know what happened, but I am happy to be here. <laughs> Thank you for um, having me. It's really excited. I used to work in the North End, so um, I was really excited to get this one in particular. <laughs> oh, that's so cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I worked at the Paul Revere House for several years. Oh, nice. Mm -hmm. Aww. Oh, that's yeah. awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so we could probably start about now. It's 7 o'clock. Okay. All right. So um, I'm happy to be at the, ooh, every, all my icons just changed. Uh, sorry, got distracted. <laughs> I'm happy to be here at the North End Public Library, um, virtually, not in person, um, with Jennifer Hawes. You're the branch librarian, correct? That's right, I am the branch librarian. <laughs> <laughs> um, so feel free, Jennifer, you can like welcome your, your patrons if you'd like. Yes, uh, I welcome everybody. Um, I have not seen many of you in quite some time. I miss you. Um, I really am looking forward to being open normally again. I hope you're all safe and well um, in this nutty time. And um, I have a feeling many of you who are here tonight are, um, are quite good with, or quite versed in North End history uh, North End, um, you know, different, the background of different locations. So I don't know. I, I'm not sure if Rachel's going to be able to stump you, <laughs> but um, we got a lot of knowledgeable patrons and um, I wish I could see you all right now. Um, I wish you could see me. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm just a bunch of lines uh, and um, I'm, I'm, Glad that you're here. Yeah, me too. I'm so glad that everyone's here tonight. Um, we got a lot of signups so far. We also have a lot of people tuning in. Um, definitely Ooh. more than we would have had in person. So that's exciting. Yeah. <laughs> that's the, the one good thing about doing virtual programming is we don't have space and, and commutes and all of that stuff to worry about. Um, as much. Yeah, it really it makes it easy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So, um, without further ado, I think I will start it off. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Yeah, thank you. So, um, let me add my little PowerPoint here. Um, before I really get into gear here, I want to acknowledge that we work on, live in, and are discussing land that was the traditional and ancestral land of Native peoples. But is now the city of Boston, European settlers called the Shaman Peninsula, but to Algonquian speakers, it is called Mashawamuk. It was and is home to groups including the Mashpee and Aquina Wampanoag tribes, the Nipmuc nations, and descendants of the Massachusetts people. Tonight we're talking about land that we now call the North End for its geographic position on the peninsula. The urban atlases we're about to discuss record property ownership in the 19th and 20th centuries, a time period often thought of as long after colonization in New England. But colonialism is an ongoing process, both in the time that the maps were created and today. These atlases were produced during the same period that settler governments were prosecuting massive violent efforts at native land dispossession in other parts of the continent. Today, nations and bands are still asking for recognition and land rights from federal, state, and local governments. The land we're standing on today, um, uh, sorry, yeah, the land we're standing on today, much like the land that's documented in these atlases, cannot be understood without acknowledging the expropriation and genocide which took place during colonization. 
Many of the maps we have at the Leventhal Map Center were created for the project of colonialism, expansion, erasure, and dispossession. These urban atlases definitely represent erasure. You're not going to see any um, acknowledgement of native land ownership on these maps. But native land people, native people remain on this territory. Um, they were there in the 1920s at the maps that we're going to look at, and they're there today, um, carrying on the traditions of many generations. This land acknowledgement is really just an acknowledgement, but I hope that it becomes a seed for change for how we um, think about land and, um, and settler colonialism. So if you've never taken a look, I recommend this website, um, nativeland.ca. I'm going to share it with all of you. Native-land.ca. It's a um, digital mapping project that um, I definitely recommend taking a look at and um, thinking about the ways cartographies of colonialism relate to our lives and where we live. So leave a note about whose lands you're on in the comments. Um, I already talked about Boston, but I'm sure there are people tuning in from out of town. So I'll be looking in the comments throughout the night. Um, I want this to be interactive. There's definitely a lot of room for that. Please be polite. Um, I don't think I should have to say that, but last time there were some kind of questionable comments. Um, and I do want this to be like really interactive. So as I go through the PowerPoint, let me know if you have questions, if I'm going too fast or too slow, um, or if you have corrections, because as Jennifer pointed out, a lot of you are probably North End history buffs. And while I would say the North End is probably my best known area of Boston because I worked there for so long, um, it's definitely not, not my forte. So feel free to leave comments. Um, I do see them while I'm giving my presentation and check out nativeland.ca. There's also information there about um, treaties and language groups that I think is really interesting. So let's take a look at my PowerPoint now um, and talk a little bit about what the materials are that we're going to be talking about tonight. So they're called, we call them urban atlases as a kind of shorthand. They are, um, kind of a combination of two main types of atlases, property real estate atlases, and um, there's also fire insurance atlases. So this key right here is from a Sanborn, which is a fire insurance atlas. It's got uh, all these descriptors for what types of materials the buildings are made of, what they house. So like stables are pretty recognizable. They've got X's through it. Um, I Oh, hi, Brad. Um, I was always surprised when there were all these buildings that had X's through them, and I thought that it meant they were condemned or something like that, but no, it just means that that's a stable. There's a lot of information about window openings, um, whether something has a furnace, all sorts of things that would give you information about how much you want to insure a building for um, or not insure the building at all. So uh, over here on the right is kind of the information that most of us are actually looking for, um, at least on a surface level when we're looking at the maps, which is who owned the property. That's something that I think most of us are looking for, especially if we're doing genealogical research or something like that. So these atlases are huge. Um, they're very beautiful. They're really fun to work with, but at the same time, they're kind of cumbersome. They're like several feet wide, a couple feet tall. Um, it takes a lot of table space just at a base level for um, flipping through them. Comparing one year to another year means that you have to have enough space to look at two of these huge atlases at once. And you have to use the index to, um, to kind of find what addresses you're looking for, um, which can be really annoying, especially because addresses change over time. So we will be talking about that a little bit more. But basically, this is just to say that um, while these are really wonderful sources, um, they are a lot of work to, to maintain and to um, physically work with. 
but they can talk about um, all these, they can answer all these questions. They can tell you about the history of your specific home. Uh, we'll get to that kind of closer to the end of the, um, of the presentation. They can talk about the history of your neighborhood, which is what we'll focus on today, and how today's city is related to the city of the past. So what we've done is we've made it a lot easier for you so that you can actually access these atlases, first of all, from home or from your phone while you're walking around Boston, but also just made them a little bit more easier or a little bit more easy to um, kind of manipulate and use to your advantage when you're doing research. It's a digital transformation of over 100 atlases that cover Boston and kind of surrounding areas. So like the inner suburbs of Boston, um, like Newton, Everett. Um, and they go from 1861 to 1938. Basically, what we've done is it used to, um, when you opened up our portal, give you a whole list of plates. And what we've done instead is stitch them together um, like this kind of map here, that is not uh, like a GIS like map. Um, it's not like Google Maps. This is literally the pictures, high res scans of these pages stitched, digitally stitched together um, and overlaid over the city of Boston. So different areas have varying coverage. The North End has really great coverage. I definitely recommend um, if you live in the North End, you're gonna have a lot of uh, material to work with. So um, it, it's covered by the entire range of our atlases from 1861 to 1938. Um, there are a couple years that have two atlases, you'll notice when we like really get into the nitty gritty. Um, and that's because different manufacturers published atlases in the same year sometimes. So um, you can follow along with me here. I'm just going to do like a quick tutorial of Atlascope. So go to atlascope.leventhalmap.org. I will give you a little time to do that. And I will pull up a banner that says that as well so that you don't lose it. Um, And I'll give it to you in the chat so that you can just copy and paste if you'd like. So um, head to alliscope.leventhalmap.org. And you'll be taken to this landing page. Um, it's got three options. You can click Find Me, um, which is really fun if you're walking around Boston. I would say that's a nice uh, COVID safe activity that you can do, um, at least while it's not freezing out. You can walk around with your mask and um, have it follow you around so you can actually see like what the streets that you are walking on used to look like 100 years ago as you're going. You could start at BPL over here, which drops you down at um, the Central Library, or you can hit search places, which is what we're going to do. So we're going to search places. I'm looking up 25 Parmenter Street, which you may or may not know is the address of the North End branch. I recommend making sure before you click uh, enter or like choose one of these responses that you really read them because I have definitely made the mistake of um, hitting enter too soon and being taken to, for example, uh, Waltham or Quincy or West Newton. Um, accidentally because I did not actually read the response. So the one that you're looking for might not always be the top response. So make sure that you read them. And then you will be dropped down into um, usually the oldest overlay map. So in this case, um, 1867 is the oldest um, part, is the oldest layer that you can see this particular view. And down here at the bottom is where it tells you what which map it is, 1867. Here, let me take that banner down. It's kind of in the way. Um, it tells you that you're looking at 1867. And then on the left here, it tells you that the base map you're looking at is modern, which you can kind of see here. It says like Salem Street and over here, Charlotte Cushman School, Charlotte Cushman School and um, Cafe Victoria. 
um, which obviously very few of those used to be there, um, if any. Well, Salem Street, but probably not the cafe. Um, so then if you click that drop up, you are faced with a huge selection of, of years to choose from. As I mentioned before, 1874 has these two atlases, 1882 has two atlases. For the most part, the atlases that we have are Bromleys, which are um, not fire insurance. They are real estate atlases. The Sanborns are fire insurance. I really am partial to Hopkins. Um, we can look at that later, but I think they're really some of the most beautiful ones. So you can choose another year. Let's say we chose 1922. And we see that um, where the library is today was the site of the Cushman School owned by the city of Boston. Um, right here, this number is the number four means that this building has four floors. And right below it, uh, 10,550 is the size of the parcel. Um, I want to draw your attention to down here. This might, um, if your window is like wider than mine was, all of this stuff might be in the bottom left-hand corner instead of across the top of the, um, the little ribbon at the bottom. But somewhere, <laughs> somewhere in your uh, user interface, it will say glass right here. Um, so that's the, the way that we're looking at this right now. We've given you a couple different options. You can also swipe Y so that there's a line across um, and you can move this little hand up and down. You can swipe X and move it uh, left to right, or you can play with the opacity, um, which I think is really fun, although it depends what you're trying to do um, and how well the combination of like the original cartographer and our ability to line everything up perfectly um like those things are kind of uh what really make the difference for whether this looks very good or not but for the most part they did a really good job making these beautiful maps and we did a really good job um digitally transforming them uh so they they do look really cool and you can kind of um compare the shapes and sizes of buildings to see um if they are uh, if they're the same building that they were in 19, you know, 22, uh, or not. So that'll give you some clues that you can use for your research. You can also change the base map. So right now I have it on the modern streets, but you could change it to modern aerial view if you wanted. Um, so right here, this is overlaid on like a modern satellite image. Um, at the bottom here, um, you, you kind of can't see the arrow here, sorry, but right at the bottom, um, it's almost hidden, but there's this little phrase that says about this map. And that's something that's really useful um, if you want to know more about what you're looking at. If you click that, it'll take you to this um, source information page with the title, the publisher, the year that the map was published, um, what collection it's in. So usually it's gonna say, well, Leventhal Map and Education Center at the Boston Public Library. Um, and then information about this atlas in the library collection. So this is the part that's really um, crucial probably for, for most people. You can um, view the plate in the digital collections. So you can actually see what the original plate looked like um, and really zoom in um to basically like the paper grain level um you can also download so if you go to those then you can download the, the plates as um as geojson so that the way that they're already geo transformed you can download them as tiffs so like high quality archival imagery or just as jpegs um, and this is what it would look like so i think this is a really cool thing to look at before you really dive into Atlascope to show you that um, like this is what they look like in the book. You can even see like the, the pages before and the pages after um, and these little tabs for each page to tell you which plate turned to. 
Um, this one is plate eight, and it's the same one we were just looking at that the, um, the library was on that used to be the Cushman School. So um, now I'm going to ask for a kind of audience participation uh, moment. So um, I'm going to give you a second to go to alescope.leventhalmap.org and tell me what the name of the school was at 70 Charter Street in 1922. So this is a bit of a doozy. This school um, closed, I believe, in 1989. So you're not going to find it if you Google this address, I don't think, although I could be wrong. Um, so what you're going to do is you're going to go to Aliscope. You're going to click um, Search Places, the button in the middle. And then type in 70 Charter Street. Make sure you select the one in the north end. Um, so the, the zip code should be like 02113 or something. Um, could be off by a little bit on that. And then um, tell me what the, the name of the school was in 1922. So down at the bottom, you're going to click the, the drop-up list in the bottom right-hand corner. Select the 1922 map. And then, bingo, you should have it. So I'm going to give everyone another minute because I know that it takes a little bit to get used to <laughs> how Alescope works. I'm like, I use it every day pretty much. So for me, uh, it doesn't take me very long to find things, but it might take everyone a little bit longer. So I'll give you another minute. Or I awkwardly don't talk that much. Oh, that tea is really cold. Okay. I'm gonna give you another 20 seconds or so. If I don't get an answer, I'm gonna have to just tell you, which is okay. Um, but there is going to be an audience participation section at the end of this, and I <laughs> want you guys to be warmed up already. All right, I'm gonna give it away. So the answer is the Michelangelo School, um, which was two words in 1922 um, when the school was, um, was founded, or I think it was founded around then, maybe a little bit before. Um, before this in Atlascope, it just says school on it. Um, and then eventually the words were uh, smushed together, Michelangelo, um, and it's on Charter Street at, at about 70. It's a little bit hard to say exactly what address it used, because if you look across the street here, all of the odd numbers, um, there's like a pretty wide spread from like 59 to 75. So I gave you 70 um, as kind of a, a happy medium. Um, but yeah, this is what it what it used to look like. Um, I think it's been transformed into housing. Um, thank you. Wipeout 2649 found the answer. Um, yeah. The, so yeah, there's a there are a lot of schools in the North End. That was something that I really found when I was scrubbing through to find content for tonight. Um, there there are just so many schools, um, and this is just one of them. There is now a street right by it called Michelangelo Street um, or Michelangelo Court, maybe, um, and it is supposedly, according to Wikipedia, at least. The, um, the only Italian named street in the North End, which is kind of ironic and very interesting when you think about like who is living in a place versus who is naming the geographies. Um, so I just wanted to point out this, this picture um, and many of the pictures that we're going to be looking at tonight are, um, are searchable and you can find them using Digital Commonwealth, which is uh, kind of a collection of collections from Massachusetts 
our collections are searchable in here. Um, all of the BPL, like photography collections and so on, are um, searchable. There's a really good uh, Sacco and Vanzetti collection <laughs> that you always get a lot of hits for, no matter what you're searching. And um, also, what was I thinking? There's a lot of like papers, um, documents by really famous people. There's like a lot of documents from W.E.B. Du Bois um, and, and many others. Um, a lot of the, ooh, what's it called? That um, newspaper, I'll remember later, The Liberator? I don't remember. Um, there's a, so anyway, it's a very um, comprehensive collection of different collections, um, all like digital collections. So if you search in this bar, like I searched North End, um, it's gonna give you everything, return everything that has anything to do with the North End anywhere. Um, but you can also kind of limit your search. So over here at the left, there's, you can limit your search by topic, you can limit it by year, um, by all sorts of things. And like, I will say that not all of the collections are really well tagged with good metadata. So sometimes you'll like narrow your search a little bit too much by choosing some of these things. But I do recommend kind of playing around with it and seeing what you find. Uh, one of the things that I found when um, looking through the North End on uh, Digital Commonwealth is this um, North Street reading room um, of the Boston Public Library. So different from the actual branch of the Boston Public Library, this is uh, a reading room that was at 207 North Street. Um, it's got this great sign with the free to all message. Is there a keyboard shortcut for zooming in and out? Um, yes, control plus should probably work, Carl. Um, and then right here, uh, this is a delivery station of the Boston Public Library, free to all. Uh, cards may be obtained here. Books will be, I think this says issued here, um, ask for information. So I really love this. Um, I think it would be great if there were more reading rooms available, <laughs> especially right now. It feels like um, very valuable to have had places where you could go and uh, do something like read or just sit and not be um, not be getting people sick. So I'm going to just like go into a little bit of exploration of Atlas Scope um, in the North End and. Feel free to like throw stuff out there if I am wrong about something, especially, um, or if you have the answers to the questions that um, that my research has raised for me, I'd be happy to know about it. So I started um, at the original um, public library branch in the North End um, that that is referenced on the BPL webpage for the North End branch. Um, which was from 1913 to 1965, I think. Um, it was here on, what street is this? I don't actually know what street this is. Hold on. Um, anyway. Um, so this is a where the public library was on North Bennett Street. Okay, that's what I thought. Um, next to the Christopher Columbus School. Um, the earliest map that we have that lists it is 1917 because we don't have one from 1913. Um, that's something that's like a little disappointing to a lot of people, I think, is that we don't have one from every year. But that is uh, that's just kind of how old collections work. You're not going to find something from every year, but Hopefully you can kind of fill in the gaps with other resources. For example, um, pictures. So here's this really great picture of um, the where the library was on North Bennett Street. Um, and then what it looks like there today. So you can definitely see the resemblance. Um, you can tell it's the same building. It's got the same buildings in the background here, um, but it 
is missing something. So up here above the doorway, there was this like really pretty um, relief um, and sculpture that is no longer there. So it used to say Boston Public Library, North End Branch above the doorway here. And um, there are a lot of pictures from inside the branch as well. There's this one from um, when there's nobody in here. Something that I thought was particularly interesting is that it has this kind of like square um, open uh, like skylight maybe, which reminds me of the modern North End branch. Um, so maybe people who, who grew up in the North End know more about that because it obviously they, they probably made architectural decisions based on what it used to look like. Um, but I was really surprised to see that. And then here is um, it's the children's room. Here's uh, the children's room completely full of children. Um, it looks like they're doing their homework, but I'm not totally sure. They definitely look very studious. Um, and I would imagine that they kept a tight rein on uh, what you were allowed to do in the library. There was actually another um, public library location, or at least one that claims to be a public library, it might not be, it might be kind of like using the words public library <laughs> in maybe a different way than we're used to, or maybe it was where they stored certain books. I don't know, if anybody knows this, um, feel free to chime in. But in 1879, the Associated Charities Industrial Building um, was founded here where the Salem Street Church used to be. There was still a church um, on the, second floor. Um, I really love this. This is a Sanborn with a lot of detail, this 1882 one, and it's it covers all of downtown Boston. So if you get a chance, I definitely recommend just like panning around this beautiful 1882 atlas because it's just so dense in information. Um, like here at this corner, this is like irrelevant to what I'm talking about right now, but it just says like, ovens and cellar not used for 100 Salem Street. Like that's such, for one, 160, such rich information that like, I can't really think of a reason why I would need it, but I'm sure there's somebody who's doing some kind of research that, that it would be helpful for. Um, so I think that's really cool. But anyway, the Associated Charities Industrial Building has a laundry and drying room, et cetera, in the basement dining, library, etc. on the first floor, church and sewing room on the second floor, schools on the third, and printing and carpentry on the fourth. So you can see up here, um, it's a three-story building with a French roof. So I guess the, the fourth floor is kind of an attic-y space. Um, that same location in 1888, um, so that's just six years later, it's now just labeled as industrial school and public library. Um, this is the original location of the North Bennett Street School on North Bennett Street, which it no longer is, which I was very confused by when I um, first started working in the North End. But I think it's the oldest technical school in the country. I could be wrong about that. Um, and it's a really great place. I miss walking by. But yeah, so it used to also house a public library, some kind of public library facility. I'm a little bit confused about it because even though it predates um, the library just down the street that I was just talking about, it also seems to overlap with it. So if anybody knows why that is, I that's like a, a research hook that um, that my kind of cursory research has opened up. I wanted to, I found a great picture, so I wanted to talk a little bit about the North End Beach right here. Um, and then just have people like, first of all, this map in particular is really beautiful. This is a 1938 uh, atlas. I love this little like uh, curve, gentle curve of the North End Beach. Um, and then you can really see that same curve reflected in this photograph of people bathing there in the 1930s. I think that this is from the Leslie Jones collection of uh, photography. 
And then speaking of the North End Beach, I just wanted to see if anybody can see um, what the difference is between these two images. There's something missing in 1922 that's there in 1917. And I would be surprised if nobody knows what it is. It has to do with something that happens in 1919 on this property owned by the Boston Elevated Railway Company, or at least managed by the Boston Elevated Railway Company. So if anybody knows what changes in 1919 in this, um, between these two pictures, uh, let me know. There's, um, it's, it's subtle, but it's also quite uh, catastrophic, I would say, uh, is a good word for it. Um, yeah, <laughs> the molasses tank. So we've got a bunch of responses. Um, the molasses tank is actually this blue circle right here. And you can see that it's there in 1917, and then it's no longer there in 1922. So the molasses flood happens in January 1919. Um, it um, completely obliterates this um, it, its immediate surrounding area. It blows out this fire station right here and kills several people inside and, and traps others. Um, it actually knocks out the bottom of some of the elevated rail right here. Um, so Amy, you noticed that it's like there's trains going by right here. Um, so there was actually a train coming by when the molasses flood happened. Um, for folks who don't know, Basically, <laughs> there was a really shoddily built um, tank that held, I think, two million gallons uh, of molasses. It was um, always making creaking sounds and freaking people out. And then one day um, it burst. So it's basically a, a temperature and pressure kind of thing that happened. Um, the molasses had to be warm in order to um, pump it from the ship that it was coming off of uh, into the tank. Um, but of course, temperature and pressure um, kind of amount to the same thing. So uh, it was much too high pressure and it exploded. So it sent like a basically a tidal wave of uh, molasses around the surrounding area, um, killed uh, about 20 people, um, killed a lot of animals. There's a stable somewhere right here a city stable. So like I was talking about right at the beginning, there's a stable here with an X through it and um, killed a lot of horses. So if you if you want to know more, that was kind of a dark turn, but I definitely recommend um, the book Dark Tide by Stephen Paleo. Here's what the um, what the elevated rail looked like um, before it got uh, demolished, both um, in part in the molasses flood and then in full a couple decades later. Um, as you may have noticed, there is no elevated rail in Boston anymore, um, but there there was one um, right here. This is the Hanover Street Station. So I think this is the Atlantic um, line, Atlantic Street line. So um, it would move down here. Oh, this one's kind of blurry, sorry. Um, so I think that this is where that picture is taken from, just like uh, kind of northeast of this intersection, northwest of this intersection. Um, and I think that these two big brick buildings, Dennis and Lovejoy stores, I think that those are these two brick buildings over here on the left, um, but I could be mistaken. And then here is the railway being dismantled in the same area um, right by North End uh, Beach. So this is in 1942, I believe, um, that the, the Atlantic Street Rail is being taken down. Something that um, the North End is, was definitely known for is the, the tenement buildings. So there used to be, like today, almost all of the North End that you walk around and see is brick buildings. Um, but there were quite a few wood buildings that were basically falling apart 
for, for a lot of the 20th century. This one is um, 430R uh, Hanover Street. So the rear, um, the building at the rear of 430, it's also in some documents called 430 and a half Hanover Street. So it's this wooden building right behind here um, on this property owned by Mary Consolo. I've definitely commented on this before, um, but I, I have been surprised um, in going through all of these atlases by how many women owned property in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. I feel like the way that I was taught about, I don't know, women's history was that women like weren't allowed to own property for a very long time. Clearly that was not true in Boston. Um, it seems for the most part, like these are inheritances and not purchases, but um, be that as it may, it's still still like a major um, portion of history that I feel like I wasn't aware of before I used these maps a lot. So Mary um, is a big part of this little story that I'm gonna tell. She um, seems to have inherited this property um, in her 20s from another Consolo, maybe her father. Um, I wanted to know more about this building because it's like clearly in incredible disrepair. These photos are from 1936. Um, so I went to the city of Boston permit search, which I hugely recommend if you're looking up histories of specific buildings. Um, so I put in 430 and then Hanover, came up with a bunch of, res of um, results, including some from 1936 and seven, which I thought would be very promising and I was correct. So here's this um, letter to, I almost said email. <laughs> here's this letter to the um, building commissioner saying that um, there's an unsafe complaint at number 430 and a half Hanover Street. Mary, her name is spelled wrong here, Cole Solo. I find was the owner of record. And then there's a mortgagee. Um, the city of Boston has tax title and started foreclosure earlier this year. And Mary did not appear and defaulted on her loan. So um, they're basically offering the mortgagee. Uh, they, they offered her like two months. Um, no, basically one month uh, to redeem uh, the property by paying over $3,000, which is uh, a lot of money to ask for from someone <laughs> on such short notice today. And I can't imagine um, what it would have been back then. So I'm very curious about what happened to this woman um, because I went to the 1940 census right after this, and there are Consolos living at the address, but no Mary. Um, in the 1930 census, there is a Mary Consolo. And then um, at the bottom of this page, or maybe on the back of it, uh, on a separate page, it says the rear wall and side wall of this building should be shored forthwith or building raised at once. So the superintendent um, made that, that uh, judgment in 1936. And then in 1937, um, it was proposed that it be taken down um, at the building, by the building department. However, the map that we were looking at originally is from 1938, and it has that building on it still. I would not, though, take the years of our maps as like strict gospel um, for what year it actually, like representing the year perfectly. Um, it's possible that they started working on that neighborhood long before, or like that block area, the year or two before the map was published. Um, and it's also possible that they uh, didn't check <laughs> the back and they just copied an old version of the map. So kind of hard to tell, but definitely very interesting. And I would like to keep looking into this. Um, here's who lived there um, at 430 in the rear. In, um, in the 1930 census, I counted and there are like 30 people, 30 something people living in a three-story wood building. Um, 
they are all Italian, all of them, all of their parents were born in Italy. And then some of them under the age of like 18 were born in Massachusetts or Connecticut, or um, here's one from Rhode Island, um, who's just a baby, nine twelfths, I think means that she's nine months old. And um, yeah, so this hugely Italian neighborhood although not entirely Italian. So something that I also like doing with these maps is looking at religious spaces because the names on the buildings just mean, like we saw before with Mary, who owns the building and not who actually lives there. So it is really important to kind of go into ancestry, go into census documents, um, look at who actually lives in a place instead of just who owns it because you're going to find a much richer version of history um, that way. I also look at religious spaces. So um, right here at this tiny juncture of Salem Street and Baldwin Place, there are three different congregations, Jewish congregations, Shara Zedek, Beth Israel, and Beth HaMidrash. Um, which is clearly Beth HaMidrash, Shari Jerusalem. So that's where Jerusalem place gets its name. Um, and then there are a lot of Jewish, at least landowners around this area. And I wouldn't be surprised if they lived there as well. Um, that would be <laughs> a rabbit hole for ancestry for another day. But I definitely um, encourage you to use ancestry um, to, to do this research. I find that the map kind of serves as an entry point to your research and also as like a connection between different resources. So sometimes, especially because addresses change over the years, these maps are the only thing that can tell you what the address used to be for a building. Um, and that's really, really crucial. Um, but yeah, I'm going to invite everybody to share addresses that you are interested in looking up in the North End um, to see like what used to be there. I'm going to stop my screen share and then share a brand new screen. Um, while I'm doing this, think about where you want to look up. So where do you want to start exploring? Yep. Okay, so I'm going to search places. Um, something that I think maybe freaks people out is when you hit search places, this thing pops up and like it goes to somewhere underneath. But what it goes to is just um, Copley, so the central library. Okay, so um, I'll wait for people to give me suggestions for what to look up, but I'll start with one of my favorite places at 19 North Square, which is um, the Paul Revere House, which you can see here um, is 17 North Square in 1867, um, wood building with this little L at the back very recognizable as the Paul Revere House if you've ever been in there. Um, and then by 1908, which is when it opens as a museum, it says it's owned by the Paul Revere Memorial Association, which is still true. So some things, some things don't change. <laughs> Let's look up, um, Ruth has requested 350 North Street. So um, I want to draw your attention to this, which is that I looked up 350 and the address that it's giving me here is 354. Um, so just be aware, like when you look places up that the, the address has sometimes changed. So let's look at 1902. And now 350 is on the corner here. Is 350 on the corner now, Ruth? Um, Oh yeah, it is. So if we make it really small, we can see the underlying map and we can see that it's this whole building. 
Um, so let's see if that building exists. Doesn't look like doesn't look like it was there. Um, it was owned by this realty company in 1938. So I wouldn't be surprised if they bought up all of this and then sold it off um, to build this 350 building. Okay, let's look at one and a half Endicott Street. Okay. So that's probably this building right here in 1861. Let me look at what it looks like today. Oh, <laughs> today it is the Greenway. Um, that's always disappointing. Okay. So in 1922, it was owned by a George F. Parker. Um, and then same in 1928. And then by 1938, this whole area is owned by New England Trust Company um, et al. trustees. So that's something that you're going to see, <laughs> especially downtown again and again, is that it goes from like in this area here, like 1928, 1938, these maps um, start showing you companies owning things instead of uh, people owning things, which is probably not that surprising to everybody, but it is very disappointing when you're trying to do like genealogical research or something like that. Um, let's look for 279 Hanover Street. And it's a little bit more modern. Cool. So this in 1898, this property was owned by a Moses Silverman. Um, these were two four-story brick buildings, 270, uh, 279 and 285. Um, I'm kind of jumping ahead in the years here. Keeps owning it for quite a while. And these are still two four-story brick buildings. Yeah, so he still owns it in 1938, which is impressive. And I would kind of be surprised if the same guy owned it. Maybe it was his um, descendants, because this is a long time <laughs> to own a piece of property. But you never know. Um, some people, some people last a long time. Let's look at uh, 197 North Street. Back to North Street. Oh, again. Um, if you look at this here, so 97. So 197, is that a playground today? It was, ooh, that's really hard to read. Owned by some trustees company in 1922. In 1912, it's this tiny little wood building in front of a big long brick building owned by somebody with what looks like a pretty Italian name, but some of the letters are hard to read. Giangiana or something? Hmm. That's pretty interesting. That's a very interesting little house. Um, I would love to know more about that. It's right next to the North End Mission as well. Okay, let's look at 300 Commercial Street. Okay, 
Oh, isn't this map beautiful? Look at this 1867 map. I love the colors on this one. There's a little brush factory here, chair finishing, um, a cooper shop, several coopers, and a couple carpenters. Um, 300 is conspicuously not labeled. But let's look at the 1882 map that I was talking about before, because that one's very likely to have um, good information. So let's see, carriage and BSM shop, first floor, caulker and tool, RB, um, sail loft on the fourth and fifth floors. So that's pretty interesting. It's, this, it's a five-story building with a lot of different um, kind of <laughs> uh, manufacturers in it in 1882, um, owned by a, the heirs of a Turner later. And then it does become part of, ooh, this is exciting. So this is, um, it becomes this building of um, oops, Liggett's Candy Manufactory, and then I think United Candy Company. Um, you can zoom in by rolling your your scroll wheel, so like on your um, on your mouse, or if you have a trackpad, by uh, kind of spreading your fingers apart on the trackpad, um, or if you hit Control Plus on your screen, it should zoom in as well. But that will also make the controls bigger, so kind of up to you. Um, the second version of Atlas Scope will be coming out eventually, <laughs> and it will have like what you're maybe more used to with the, the zooming and the plus and the minus, like on Google Maps. So yeah, so 300 um, Commercial Street was also a candy company, uh, like this, and then United. Up through 1938. Let's look at uh, 121 Salem Street. So also, yeah, the 1938 map is just so pretty. It's got the greatest colors. Um, so 121. So interestingly, like I was mentioning before, in 1867, the area that that we now know as 121 Salem Street, um, it looks like it was like 107 and 108, or 103 and 107, yeah. Uh, let's jump ahead a little bit. And then you can see by 1902, they have our addresses. Um, oh yeah, I see it's right across from these synagogues um, that I was showing us before. These are five-story brick buildings owned by Julius Rottenberg. Um, I'd be interested to know if these are the same buildings that they used to be. Owned by his heirs by 1917. And then a Viola Penansky um, by 1938. So she seems to have bought or inherited both buildings from him. So that's pretty interesting. Um, that stretches from 115 to 121. So Amy has a really good question. Uh, once you've found the address on a particular map, is there a quick way to switch to a fuller version of the Atlas page or map in question? Um, yeah, so you can download this. I would recommend the best way to do it is if we wanted to take, for example, this, like, Let's say uh, Viola is my grandmother and I'm interested in this map in particular. So, oh, I'm gonna take your comment down so everyone can see what I'm doing. Um, so I'm gonna click about this map down here in the right-hand corner. Um, and then probably what I wanna do is find this plate in digital collections. Can you see that? No, okay. So it'll take you to, um, another page, you'll basically click on, click on 
the place that you're interested in. It'll ask if you want to view this place in digital collections. And then it'll take you um, straight there um, to a page where you can download. Um, there are like multiple downloads. There's the master TIFF version. There's a full resolution and medium resolution JPEG. There's a geo TIFF um, and there are other options as well if you want to like do something with KML or WMS um, if, if that floats your boat. Um, you can also just from right here, if what you're interested in is like a GIS question, um, just click download plate footprints right here um, or use this to um, for, for tiling. Um, but yeah, if you are interested, if you have more questions, I will definitely, um, I'm available anytime. I'm uh, available by email. So um, definitely if you, if you find my phone number anywhere, it's not going to reach me probably because I don't think I've even, I haven't even set up my voicemail. I was only hired a couple months ago and I haven't actually been into the office. Um, since I was hired. <laughs> so um, yeah, hit me up on email if anybody has questions. We've we've built guides for a lot of the questions that people have for like how to navigate Alloscope. So I can, I'm happy to send those to anybody. Um, you can put my email in the chat. Um, it's pretty uh, self-explanatory, but it's rmead at levenbombapp.org. Um, so I have this question here, Cops Hill Terrace, what led to it becoming a park in 1888? Um, let's look at it. I don't actually know the answer to that, but uh, yeah, so something that I'm, really, I'm actually very glad you brought this up, Paul, because this is something I wanted to talk about. Um, so this map is from 1888, right? But it is edited clearly, very prettily, in 1893, um, December 7th, 1893, it is taken for a park. Um, so this is something that happens pretty regularly is that these um, atlases just kind of get marked up. Um, you can see this part is also taken for a park um, to make the beach. Um, you can also see like the square footage changes for some areas. Um, basically, they don't usually provide the reasons for why stuff like this happens. So I don't actually know what decisions were made that created this park. Um, but I, I definitely think that that would be something that you could look into. And this map is kind of your jumping off point um, for research. Um, and yeah, I, I love this one in particular. I was trying to, I was looking for it before, so I'm so glad you brought it up because it's got this like really cute little blue stripy border. Um, someone's like gone to the trouble of like putting shadows around the, the light blue text. Um, and there's all sorts of other things that have been changed on this map as well. So, so yeah, I don't know why Cops Hill Terrace was created as a park, but that's what happened. <laughs> um, if you find out, um, please let us know. So that looks like all of the questions that we have had. Oh, designed by Frederick Olmsted. Thank you. Um, that looks like all the questions that we have. If you have any more questions, um, please email me. I'm also going to drop this um, drop this link to you guys for a feedback form. Um, if you have any feedback on tonight's event, on what I could do better, what I could do differently, or um, things that you're that you learned tonight, um, it would be really great if you could fill that out. Um, constructive criticism is um, definitely encouraged, and um, thank you guys so much. I had a really good time tonight, and um, I love talking about the North End. Um, I love talking about these maps. 
I just want you guys to see how beautiful the colors are on this 1938 map before we go. Um, I've been doing like areas that, that this map doesn't cover recently. So I'm really happy <laughs> that I can finally show it off. Um, truly gorgeous. Um, thank you, George W. Bromley. And thank you everyone who came. Have a good night.